I'm a bookmaker, and right now on camera, I want to lay you nine to five that Nicky Bonds, Leroy Bonds, gets out of jail. New York gangster Herbie Sperling spoke with Barnes when they were in prison together in New York, and they worked out a drug deal at Barnes' suggestion that eventually resulted in the conviction of Sperling's son. I'm doing the same sentence that Nicky Barnes was doing. Life without Life parole. Life without parole. I've got it the longest in the country. It's worse than a dead sentence. A dead sentence, you're dead, and life goes on. Here you linger and you linger, and sometimes people get depressed. Now, some people get so depressed that they decide to make up a story. You think he's going to get out? There's no doubt in my mind. The government has to let him out. This is part of their propaganda ploy. What they're saying is anybody that wants to get out, just make up stories about a lot of people. We got plenty of room. We got a lot of, a lot of prisons. We'll replace them with you, and we'll let you out. No matter what you did, no matter what you do. Herbert Herbie Sperling was a poverty-stricken Jewish kid born on December 29, 1938 in the gritty Hell's Kitchen section of Midtown Manhattan's Far West Side. By the time he was a teen, he was said to have relocated down to the Little Italy area around the 6th and 4th wards, where he would reside and hang around the area's Italian hoodlums for the rest of his days. He had little supervision at home. His father had died when Herbie was only a year old, and his mother didn't have the wherewithal to properly raise and deal with him. It would soon lead him astray. Herbie was always in trouble in school or on the streets with the cops, and was sent to a juvenile reformatory at the tender age of 13 for truancy. By his mid-teens, he was already dealing heroin in Manhattan. In fact, in 1958, when he was only 19 years old, he was arrested in a major narcotics case along with Genovese family soldier Joe Valachi and other top mafia traffickers, including Vito Genovese himself. Young Sperling was thought to have been getting his drug supply from Valachi. He got married early, and by the early 1970s, as he started earning better on the streets, he moved his wife and their three sons out to the South Belmore section of Nassau County. There, Sperling indulged himself buying expensive cars, two luxury boats he docked by his home that he liked to cruise the waters of the Great South Bay in, and reportedly, even an original Picasso painting. Before I continue, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave us a comment after you've watched the video. Underworld lore has it that when he was a kid growing up downtown, mob boss Vito Genovese had met and taken a liking to little Herbie. He was soon allegedly being utilized by older neighborhood racketeers to run numbers, carry a few packages of dope across town to various customers, and other similar tasks easily performed by a young mob star struck kid. Hence, his later arrest with Genovese and his minions. By the time he was a young man, he was said to have developed a ferocious hair-trigger temper. He was also generally known to have a foul mouth and wasn't afraid to speak his mind. He also had no issues voicing his hatred of rats and stool pigeons. He once said in a magazine interview, What happened to honor? As a kid, I was taught that being a tattletale was a bad thing. In his early years, while earning his stripes and growing his underworld reputation, New York City law enforcement suspected Sperling of committing several murders, whether at the direction of his mafia superiors or by his own design. During his rise to become one of New York's most voracious narcotics merchants, he was also said to have committed several additional killings to maintain his power and position by instilling the fear of God in his associates and subordinates. A good example of this was the murder of his close aide, Louis Melito. Not to be confused with that other infamous Louis Melito, this Louis Melito was identified as a drug courier in Sperling's organization. In February 1972, Melito's body was found stuffed in the trunk of a burning car near Monroe, New York, about an hour north of Belmore. He had been hacked to death with an axe, decapitated, and both hands had been severed at the wrists. The medical examiner was only able to identify him through dental records after finding his teeth in his stomach, which he apparently had swallowed during the savage beating. This, by the way, is what is known in the underworld as a buckwheat's beating. Melito was supposedly killed for having had the audacity and bad judgment of having tapped into several packages of heroin he was supposed to deliver to Sperling's drug customers. And he was murdered just five days after getting out on bail after being arrested for selling heroin in New York City. 
A little over a year later, in April 1973, Herbie Sperling himself was arrested, along with 90 others, for operating a huge narcotics network that smuggled heroin and cocaine into the U.S. from Italy, France, and South America. It was then distributed on the East Coast through various dealers. Herbie was accused of being a narcotics kingpin and at the very top of the network, which operated out of a Bronx social club called the Beach Rose. That July, after a very public trial lasting 19 days, Herbie Sperling was convicted on drug conspiracy charges. And of course, he wasn't too happy about it, even though he apparently leapt from his chair and clasped his hands over his head in a triumphant gesture after the verdict was read. He was also apparently very vocal during the trial as well. When the judge was instructing the jury at the start of his trial, Sperling yelled out that the judge had failed to accept proof the United States District Attorney manufactured this case. And another time during the trial, Sperling shouted out, You're a liar! after a prosecutor said something he didn't agree with. In September, while at the Federal House of Detention in Manhattan awaiting sentencing, Sperling called up a New York newspaper to give his side of the story after the newspaper ran a series of interviews with Louis Melito's wife, Cecile. She was the main witness of Sperling's trial and provided much of the evidence that got him convicted. Calling himself the Baron of Belmore, he called Melito's wife a liar, denied killing her husband, and claimed he wasn't in the junk business. I'm no lily white guy that runs to church every Sunday, he said, but I'm not in the junk business. I'm a bookmaker. I declared a $208,000 income on my taxes for last year. Why should I be in the junk and take all the chances when I can earn $250,000 from bookmaking? He also insisted that he was framed, a refrain he continued to play even on the day he was sentenced. Standing before U.S. District Judge Milton Pollack, who had asked Sperling if he had anything to say before imposing a sentence, Herbie pulled out a six-page statement from his suit pocket, and he didn't mince words. He told the packed courtroom in the beginning of his 15-minute diatribe, Anyone who came here to see me beg or plead is in the wrong courtroom. I'm asking the court for nothing. He also told the court he was framed by lying witnesses, by scum-of-the-earth federal agents, and by prosecutors who, he said, were the garbage of the human race. And then he turned his wrath on the judge. I know that I will get the maximum because it's all part of the frame-up. You know in your heart that I could not be involved in these narcotics transactions. And just to stick it to the judge a little more, he said this. You are a disgrace to the robes you wear. I got neither a fair trial or justice. As you take my life, I am and always will be a better man than you. And then he finally ended it with, I sentence you to think about me the rest of your life. May God have mercy on your soul. Authorities didn't call him a showman for nothing. But none of it fazed Judge Pollack, who handed him a life sentence, ensuring that Herbie Sperling would never again see the light of day. As a side note, according to Cecile Melito, when she showed up at trial, which Sperling hadn't been expecting, he apparently turned white, but then recovered, smiled at Cecile, and blew her a kiss. She interpreted this as a kiss of death. She then went into hiding, fearing for her life, but was still able to give that New York newspaper an in-depth interview that was published only days before Sperling was sentenced. Sperling, by the way, was highly suspected, but never charged with Louis Melito's murder. Even while he was behind bars, Herbie Sperling still managed to make headlines. His name figured into the 1977 contract murder of fellow narcotics kingpin Vincent Papa, who was serving his own decades-long sentence for heroin trafficking at the same federal prison as Sperling. At the time, Papa was suspected of turning informant. Sperling was accused of hiring three fellow inmates to kill Papa because the underworld had discovered that Vinny was providing prosecutors with evidence of corruption within the New York City Police Department. Papa had started naming names of policemen and detectives, as well as police higher-ups, who were involved in the theft of over 400 pounds of heroin and cocaine from the police property clerk's office evidence room in Lower Manhattan. Much of the heroin stolen from the evidence room had been sitting there for nearly a decade and was from the case infamously known as the French Connection. Sperling's killers had caught Papa as he entered the prison exercise yard one morning. Momentarily out of view from prison guards, they pounced on Papa and repeatedly stabbed him to death with homemade shanks until he collapsed in a pool of blood on the ground. 
Sperling was subsequently charged with the murder, but was later acquitted at trial. The Sperling surname once again came to the forefront when Herbie's own son Nicholas was indicted in 1983 for trafficking heroin, along with Beverly Ash, the girlfriend of notorious former West Harlem heroin kingpin Nicky Barnes and several of his minions. From behind prison walls, Herbie and Nicky Barnes had conspired to start moving kilo quantities of heroin again. It seems that old habits die hard, but Barnes had secretly turned informant, hoping to reduce his life sentence. So, he started providing information to authorities about the drug deal, which included Sperling's son Nicholas and Beverly Ash, but also later included, with the help of Nicky Barnes, an undercover DEA agent. It would result in a drug conviction for the 23-year-old Nicky Sperling. Beverly Ash was shot to death in a Harlem bar while on bail awaiting the start of her own trial. And Nicky Barnes? Well, that's a story for another day. As another side note, Sperling's middle son, Gus, was arrested in 1986 for being part of a huge heroin network operating out of the Lower East Side. Indicted along with him was the dean of dope dealers for the Lucchese family, none other than Joe Beck di Palermo himself, who was at that time already 79 years old. In a 1994 jailhouse interview he gave to Prison Life magazine, Sperling admitted that he wasn't innocent after all of the narcotics conspiracy charge he was convicted of. I'm not innocent, he said, but life without parole? That's nuts. What I got is a slow death sentence. They'd be doing me a favor if they put me in the electric chair and ended the story once and for all. Sperling had already been incarcerated for 21 years at the time of the Prison Life magazine interview, and he would serve 24 more years before his story finally ended. Herbert Herbie Sperling died on July 3, 2018, of natural causes, in a Massachusetts hospital near the Devons Medical Prison Facility where he spent his final years. He was 79 years old. Be sure to check out our Mob Fireside Chat Library for our videos on Joe Beck D. Palermo and his brother Charlie Brody, as well as our video on Vincent Papa. And if you're looking for even more in-depth mafia stories, the only place you need to go is the button guys of the New York Mafia website at www.thenewyorkmafia.com. Be prepared to spend some time delving into our vast collection of articles and bios. And don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and let us know what you thought about this video in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Until next time.